we'll cruise through here today as we talk about Mental Health 101. So who am I? Well, my name is Jack Veach. I am the health promoter and educator for the Canadian Mental Health Association, Halliburton, Kawartha Pine Ridge. That means that I go around to different schools, to events like this, I go to businesses, I talk about mental health, I talk about our programs and services at CMHA, I talk about mental illness and I explain different things and try to educate people on what mental health is. Uh, prior to being the health promoter and educator, I was what's called a release from custody case manager, a forensic case manager. People familiar with our super jail here in town? Ever seen our super jail outside town? No one? You guys don't? You know, there's a big jail outside town. You guys want to check it out. So out on 36, my job used to be to go into the super jail and meet with inmates. And I'd sit down and meet with inmates and whatever goals they had from when they were going to be released back into the community, whether it was trying to find a place to live, trying to get medications, trying to get hooked up with a psychiatrist, it was my job to help them along that path. Four or five years was enough of that. I decided to take a nice job where I can put on a dress shirt and try to look like I know what I'm doing. So we're going to go through here today and like I said, if there's any questions, just ask them as we go. So the purpose, you know why I'm here? We want to learn the terminology surrounding mental health and wellness. We want to learn specific illnesses, including common symptoms and presentation. Hopefully we're going to answer a lot of your questions surrounding mental illness. And if I don't know the answer, I'll at least tell you where the best place is you can get it. And the last thing that I really do want to highlight in all seriousness, is we're, we're going to be touching a lot of criteria today. We're going to be talking about different symptoms, but that's not going to be giving us the ability to make a formal diagnosis. We will not be learning the skills necessary to provide a diagnosis for anybody. There are going to be moments in here, I'm sure, where you'll hear symptoms and you'll hear, hear things and you'll think, oh my goodness, that sounds like such and such, or I've seen that behavior before. Do not formally diagnose them in your mind or to their face. We are not psychiatrists. You have to go to school for at least like a year or two, I think. <laughs> no, you have to go for a very long time. There's some key language points I want to highlight here today. First off, I want to talk about mental health problems. So when people think of, of mental wellness and mental illness, first of all, we have mental health just problems. Common struggles and difficulties that can affect everyone from time to time. We can all suffer from mental health problems. However, when we're talking about mental illness, we're talking about a diagnosable condition that usually requires medical treatment. People say things like, oh, you've got some mental health going on. You know, and aside from the stigma that that carries, the language is just flat out incorrect. We all have mental health just like we have physical health. And our physical health can be a spectrum of doing well or being ill. So again, we want to really highlight the difference too between mental health mental health problems, and mental illness. Another key definition, there's two I want to talk about. One is a concurrent disorder, and one is a dual diagnosis. These are a little confusing. I'm going to talk about how they apply here in Ontario, because that's what we care about, I'm sure. A concurrent disorder describes a condition in which a person has a mental health, a mental illness, or a mental health concern, and a substance use problem. So substance use problem or addiction concern in combination with an illness. Addiction and illness, concurrent disorder. What's an example of an addiction? Alcohol, Alcohol addiction. What's another one? Drugs. Drugs. Mm -hmm. Gambling? Mm -hmm. Sex? <laughs> Smoking? A dual diagnosis. In Ontario and several other provinces, this is an individual living with lifelong developmental disabilities and mental health needs. Where this gets really tricky. In the United States, those two definitions and terms are flipped. So if you're ever reading any American research papers or I think in also British Columbia, the same thing, those two de definitions are flipped. And you'll be reading about a concurrent disorder, which means some, the exact opposite in the US. That's a little tidbit. So when you go to your party on the weekend, you can impress your friends when you're talking about mental wellness. <laughs> Let's talk about some quick facts. One in four people in Canada will experience a mental illness in their lifetime. 75% of mental illnesses appear before the age of 24. The average age for onset of anxiety disorders in Canada 
is 11 years old. Early onset anxiety can be as early as five or six years old. Drug and alcohol use can trigger a mental illness. I'm going to save that one. There's some stuff that I'm going to save for next week when Desi comes in. I don't know if you might have seen him sneak in here. Desi's going to come next week. You got a sneak peek at week three. He's going to talk a lot about some really interesting stuff. And mental illness does not cause people to become violent. Another common misconception. Just because someone suffers from an illness doesn't automatically mean that they're become violent or aggressive. Some more facts. One in 10 Canadians will experience depression at some point in their life. 50% of those pe people who experience will experience more than one episode. And almost one half of those who feel they have suffered from depression or anxiety have never gone to see a doctor about this problem. One half of those people have never gone to see a doctor. Let's, let's pretend it's not mental illness. Let's pretend it's diabetes. Now run that through your mind. One, one half of people who feel that they've suffered from diabetes have never gone to see a doctor in their lifetime. Does that sound absolutely absurd? The point is, there's a major stigma that gets attached to illness. And hopefully through some of my talks and other public awareness things, we can try to eradicate stigma. What I have here is a nice little balance chart. It's right in the middle of our circle right here. This is where we like to find our center, our, our perfect balance. Now, I've been working all day. It's Monday. I am not in my perfect balance. Is anyone in here in their center on a Monday? Any of us? Some of us? Maybe? No? I'm not. But we have stressors in our life that kind of pull us away from our center. Things like personal stress, genetics, trauma, and workplace stress. They start to pull away. And they can turn into mental health concerns or mental health problems. Things like low energy, worry or fear, distraction or withdrawal, or even high energy. And we're going to talk about high energy when we talk about bipolar disorder. When we start to get too far from our center, we start to talk about an impaired function. Our activities of daily living start to be impacted. We can no longer function at our, at our normal level. All of a sudden, that distraction or withdrawal might turn into something like psychosis. Again, a little preface for week three with Desi. Low energy can turn to something like depression, worry or fear, anxiety or phobias. And high energy can sometimes manifest into full-blown mania. And again, it's kind of a sneak peek. Let's talk about some mood disorders. Now, I have a video to show. It's short, but three minutes. I tried to find a really long one that would last about the rest of the time, but I couldn't. <laughs> Now, this video, I'll be honest, is geared towards teenagers, preteens. But there's still some really impactful metaphors in this video that we're going to actually follow up on. So do your best to follow along. You'll see it, like I said, it's for teenagers, but it's, I think it's still very, very impactful. Hopefully we can hear it at the back. Hey, I'm Ellie, and this is Lynn. Hey. Last year, I was diagnosed with depression. Lynn was there to see the whole thing go down. You've probably heard the words depression before, but might not know exactly what depression means. Let's say you get some bad news. Hey. Oh my god. I just saw your boyfriend holding hands with Jenny at the mall. He is so over you. Things like breakups are painful and might make you feel sad, frustrated, angry, or heartbroken. But trust me, most teens go through that kind of stuff. Depression is something completely different. Check this out. Think of the thermostat in your house or apartment. When the temperature in your house gets too cold, the heat kicks in and brings the temperature back to just right. Your brain works a lot like the thermostat. Let me show you. Let's say this line is the just right mood. And these two dotted lines are the happy and sad range of emotions that you might feel whenever. Like the thermostat in your house. When your mood goes down, your brain makes changes to bring your mood back up. When your mood goes up, your brain makes changes to bring your mood back down to that just right level. When I was depressed, it was like the thermostat in my brain broke. My mood started going down, and I got totally stuck, like at the super low level. That's when depression came into my life. <laughs> when I was depressed, there were some really obvious signs that something was wrong. 
My sleep changed. I wanted to sleep all the time. I had no energy. Even brushing my teeth felt overwhelming. That sounds stupid, but that's how I felt. I lost interest in all the things I used to like. It seemed like nothing made me happy or excited anymore. Don't answer the phone. No one wants to talk to you. Look at yourself. Who'd want to be around you? I had lots of sad thoughts and feelings. It was like my brain kept saying things to me that I would never have thought before. Ellie, I care about you. Things are gonna get better, I promise. You're just having a hard time right now. Am I always going to be like this? I just feel so sad. You're my best friend and I know you're gonna get through this. I think you should talk to someone and try to get some help. Just leave me alone. I felt like I was on an elevator going down and I couldn't get off. I started to think that I'd be better to die than to keep feeling so sad. That scared me. I remembered what my friend Lynn said, and I decided to get help. I went to see a therapist. The therapist told me that the thoughts of sadness and hopelessness and suicide were my depression talking. My therapist said that as my mood went back up, depression would be forced to leave me alone. The other thing was to take the meds my doctor prescribed me to help my brain work the way it did before I was depressed. Having Lynn's support made a huge difference. After taking the meds for a while and talking to my therapist, I really started to feel better. Life is worth living again. I'm just happy you're back to your old self. I told you you'd feel better. All right, we've got some serious texting to do, so TTYL. Depression is a serious illness, and it is so important to get help as soon as you start feeling depressed. If you are worried that you might be depressed, talk to your doctor and tell him or her how you're feeling. You can also check out this website to learn more about depression. So pretty obviously for teenagers, but I think what it had in there, like I said, was a really interesting metaphor, the thermostat. So I stole this chart and I put it up in the PowerPoint here. We have in our middle here are just our normal range of emotion, just where our day-to-day -day existence. And below I've marked our, our sad range of emotions and up to our happy range of emotions. So now, what's something that could happen in our lives that's not necessarily catastrophic, but just a bummer, something bad that could happen? Everyone's so positive, they only got positive things? You lose your job. You lose your job, absolutely. So I, and I don't know if you can see, can you see that line at the back there? Is it clear? So we have our range of emotion right here. Our, our emotion's going along in our normal range. And at this point right here, we lose our job. And it happens. And you can see that the, the mood at this point, after the loss of job, dips into that sad range of emotions. And how do we feel at that time? Do we care about socializing? Are we concerned with our hygiene overly? Not, not really. We're just feeling low. But with time, our brain makes adjustments and brings our mood back to that just right range. Just like a thermostat, the house is too cold, the thermostat recognizes it, brings it back to that just right temperature. What we're talking about, when we're talking about someone who suffers from depression, is we're talking about now somebody whose thermostat maybe isn't working properly. And that little barrier comes in and their mood is having difficulty getting back up to that just right range. So imagine now that moment when you just lost your job. Brushing your teeth. We heard Ellie say it. Brushing my teeth was hard. That sounds silly, but that's how I felt. In that moment, we lost our job. We didn't care about going out and brushing our teeth because it wasn't important then. Imagine that feeling staying for two weeks plus. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about clinical depression, being at that low. You know, I've heard it before, and, and I have the benefit of, of having some experience frontline and working with individuals who've, who've suffered from depression. And they've told me very similar things, like, I feel like I'm just going down. And I can't get off that elevator. I can't get off that escalator. I just keep going down. 
So they feel stuck. Like this big red barrier's come in and got their mood held down. Again, imagine being at that, thing, that, that feeling for two weeks plus. When the mood persists for at least two weeks without lifting, the feeling can deepen over time and it starts to interfere and prevent the individual from conducting everyday life. Again, I, I keep coming back to the example because I like it, it came from the crowd. When you lose your job, things are different. Your priorities are changed and you're, when you're feeling low, like I said, maybe you just want to sleep. Maybe you can't sleep at all. Those are two really big criteria. Feelings of worthless, helpless, or hopeless. And I always highlight hopeless too when I talk about depression. That feeling of hopeless. Sleeping more or less than usual eating more or less than usual. It's important not to fixate on it's either not eating or not sleeping, because it can be either, eating too much, sleeping too much, sleeping all the time, or not sleeping at all. Difficulty concentrating or making difficult decisions. A loss of interest in activities you'd otherwise enjoy. For Ellie, what was her activity that she, uh, this is to see if you're actually watching the video, what was Ellie's activity that she would have otherwise enjoyed? Soccer. Soccer. At least half the people were watching. But when we just lose our job, I don't want to go out and play soccer. I don't care about it anymore. Overwhelming feelings of sadness or grief, loss of energy, and thoughts of death or suicide. And again, we, Ellie was able to push that button for help before she felt, got to the point where she felt suicidal or that she would harm herself. Any questions about this as we move along? Let's talk a little bit about bipolar disorder. So now we know what can happen when our mood goes down and gets stuck in that sad range. Now what if, what if I told you that sometimes individuals can have their mood get stuck in that happy range of emotion? This is a social experiment I've done. I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to tell you I get the same answer every single time. So I'm going to see if this is the room that, that keeps the streak alive. I would like the room to tell me one good thing that could happen to you. What is one good thing that could happen to you? One? Win the lottery. <laughs> it is every single answer. I can't, I go to, it could be grade seven to, to the senior showcase, and they're all going to say, win the lottery. <laughs> Let's imagine we just won the lottery, that feeling you have. That feeling you have when you just found out you won the lottery. How do you feel? Great. Fantastic. Yeah. On top of the world? Yeah. Feel invincible? Take on anything? I just won the lottery. Pardon me? I, I might just feel scared. Feel scared? Cool. Overwhelmed? Oh, I'll help you. I can totally help you. <laughs> we feel invincible on top of the world. Now imagine being at that, that range of emotion. Imagine being at that level for five days, five continuous days at that level of motion. There's some smiles in the crowd, They're like that sounds pretty good, I could go for that. That's what we're talking about, we're talking about mania. Now this isn't necessarily a glamorous thing. There's some very real consequences to someone who's suffering from mania. Someone who's at that level of heightened emotion often suffers with rapid thoughts, thoughts that are racing through their mind a mile a minute, difficulty sleeping. They may have rapid speech trying to converse and talk very quickly and moving from thought and thought to idea to idea. Very high energy, very eccentric, moving very, very quickly. A, a lack of an ability to see long-term consequence. Very impulsive, engaging in a lot of high-risk behaviors. So I'll give you a real-life example. Someone who is suffering from mania. This individual decided he was going to go to a car show. At this time, he was experiencing a manic episode. So he's going to the car auction. And when he comes home Saturday night, he hasn't purchased one vehicle. He bought 14 vehicles. So now I can quite confidently tell you that as a health promoter and educator, my salary does not afford me the luxury of 14 vehicle payments. So now you've got someone who's got a very real life problem who's also prone 
to experiencing depressive states. Depression. Sounds like a pretty dangerous combination to me. That's what we're talking about we're talking about bipolar disorder type 1. Is that they can be at that, that full-blown mania stage, stage of mania, as well as experiencing the, the lows of depression. Type 2 bipolar disorder is a little bit different. Instead of being in that full-blown range of mania, they would experience what, what is called hypomanic. I remember thinking, well, hypomanic sounds even more. That sounds like hypomanic. Well, no, it's actually, it's elevated from their normal range of emotion, but it's not a full-blown mania. So they're still going to experience a lot of the symptoms very elevated from their base, very excitable, very high energy, very fast-paced and moving, but not experiencing a full-blown mania. Some of the things that can come with bipolar disorder as well, uh, we're talking about rapid cycling. Four or more episodes in a year of hills and valleys. So let's look at this again. And imagine someone experiencing these cycles at least four times in a 12-month span. You can imagine, if untreated, the chaotic life that that could create for someone suffering from that illness. We type, talked about hypomania. We're talking about type 2 bipolar disorder. Uh, mixed state bipolar disorder. Mixed state type bipolar disorder. This is someone who, and I'm going to keep flipping back to my chart because I like it, because I made it. Someone who's experiencing mania, the high energy, but is still experiencing a lot of agitation, anger, or frustration. Typically still very high energy, but may possibly angry or, or difficult to, to socialize with. That's what we're talking about with a mixed state. And the easiest way I kind of like to explain that is when someone's experiencing a mania, they're prone to possibly maybe not be sleeping as much as they should, maybe only sleep two or three hours a night not feel like they need to eat three meals a day, maybe eat once, maybe eat once in the past two or three days. Let's go back. Let's pick on someone. You just won the lottery. Are you worrying about what's for lunch? Or are you too busy buying that boat? Yeah, buying something. Yeah, you're thinking about all kinds of other things. Oh, I'll eat whatever. Now, again, we're at that stage for five days. We're not eating properly. We're not sleeping properly. If I don't get at least eight hours sleep and three square meals, I am not pleasant to be around. Let's imagine again someone who's in that manic state, not sleeping, not eating properly, and again experiencing these major hills and valleys. Bipolar disorder type 1, and sorry, when I say mixed state 2, that refers to type 1 bipolar disorder, as well as the fact that some bipolar disorder can come with a symptom of psychosis. And I'm not, sorry? Sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, hills and valleys. Like yep. Yep. Like, are they like really, really happy and then just like plummet to depression? It can, or is sure. It like more of a slow no, it can be a plummet. It can be a, a, a steep decline. But again, understanding too, when I, when I talk about untreated mania, it can, can last for two to three months. If you broke your arm and you never sought treatment for it, you're probably not going to heal properly. And that pain could prolong and go on for quite some time. Mental illness is no different. If we ignore the symptoms or, or ignore things and don't treat it, we could end up suffering from this illness for longer than need be. But type 1 bipolar disorder can also come with psychosis as a symptom. Anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorders include disorders that share features of excessive fear and anxiety related to behavioral disturbances. Fear is the emotional response to real or perceived imminent threat. Anxiety is the anticipation of future threat. Let's go to a chart. I'll use the example I use every time. Sunday night, 8 o'clock, coming home from the cottage, maybe going a little bit quicker than we normally would because we've got to work Monday morning. Anyone in here guilty of that? No? Law abiding? Just you. Don't speed. Apparently, you and I are the only ones that do it, <laughs> the ones that are honest enough. We're doing a good click, coming home. All of a sudden, a deer jumps out in front of our car. There's a dangerous stimuli. 
one of our senses recognizes it. In this case, we see it. We can either see it, we smell it, we can touch it or hear it. We see it. Danger. And our brain says, we got a problem. And in that moment, our tension goes up, our alertness goes up, our perception is rise, our heart rate absolutely escalates, and we enter into our fight or flight response. We make a decision. What do we do? Hit the brakes or swerve out of the way. Or just, well, I had one lady say, we hit the deer. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, oh my goodness, well, you really were going too quick, I think. But who can relate to that moment, that moment of stress, and they can feel their heart and their tension and that adrenaline rush hits, we have to make a decision. Very relatable. That's our normal signaling chart. Let's talk about anxiety. Sunday night, 8 o'clock, flying down the highway, probably a little quicker than we should. Nothing jumps out. We don't see anything, we don't hear anything, we don't smell anything, can't taste anything. But our brain says, danger. And our heart rate goes up, our perception goes up, our tension goes up, our alertness is rise, our heart's racing a mile a minute, and there's nothing there. Now we're talking about anxiety. Anxiety can affect someone right out of a dead sleep, watching a movie. It doesn't matter. I talk to students a lot of the time. Imagine having that feeling hit you just sitting in the class, trying to pay attention to a lesson plan. Do you think it'd be pretty easy to listen to a lesson plan with experiencing these things? Is it easy? Would that be easy? No. Would you want to stick around and learn about um, the Pythagorean theorem? I was listening that day. Grade 10, I was listening. No. You want to get the heck out of that room. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about anxiety disorders. Heart beats very quickly. You could experience things like headache or dizziness, a sore stomach, chest pain, excessive worrying, nausea, shortness of breath, and a, generalized, a general feeling of terror. Some of the subtypes of anxiety disorders. A panic disorder. A panic attack is an abrupt surge of intense fear or intense discomfort that reaches a peak within minutes, and during which time four or more of the following could occur. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of these, and I don't know if a lot of you can see them at the back because it's a small font. But a lot of the symptoms are very similar to that of a heart attack. So there's one key point I really want to highlight. If we think we know that someone or we're with somebody and we feel at that moment they're experiencing a panic attack, it is strongly recommended that you just contact emergency services. Because unless you're a general physician or a doctor, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference looking at all these symptoms, trembling, shaking, sweating, palpitations of the heart, nausea, feeling dizzy, chills or heat sensations. You're probably not going to be able to distinguish whether or not this is a panic attack or an actual heart attack. So again, we always, always, always recommend calling 911. This person may probably need medical attention anyway, even if it is a panic attack, but either way, these symptoms present, contact 911. Agoraphobia, common one. Anxiety about being in places or situations from which escape might be difficult. Physiological symptoms may present nausea, dizzy, or fear of heart attack. So not necessarily the, the fear of being out in a big open space, but the fear of being unable to escape from somewhere. And, I, and again, I go back to, I talk to high school students, I'm thinking, imagine having that moment where you're in class, and you go through that signaling chart, and your heart's racing, and you're tense, and your perception's up. Is a classroom going to be a place you want to be in? be terrifying. So when they see a student run out of the classroom, they think, what the heck's going on with Joe? Maybe Joe's dealing with something else. Obsessive compulsive disorder. This is one I really talk about. This one, this one I like to talk about. And I want people to be honest when I ask this question. Who in this room has ever said to somebody or, or had said about themselves my goodness, you are so OCD, because they have to be so particular about something. So this is a kind of a misconception here. 
we're talking about an obsessive compulsive disorder, we're talking about two key components. We're talking about an obsession and a compulsion, okay? So we're talking about persistent ideas, thoughts, impulses or images that are intrusive or illogical. And the word I highlight here is intrusive. So tuck that away, intrusive, okay? The example that I want to use today is germs. Worrying about germs in general, okay? So now let's imagine, okay, I want everyone to, in their own mind, imagine for themselves that they're having constant thoughts, impulses or images that are intrusive, intrusive force in our mind without us wanting them to be there, intrusive thoughts about germs. Would I see germs on this table? Would I see germs on that chair? Would I see germs on all of my audience here? Probably, oh, I'd hear that cough and oop. But again, that idea that these are intrusive thoughts. So now I've got this obsession, okay? Now I've learned a coping skill, not necessarily a great one, in fact, a bad one, to deal with that obsessive thought. I have a compulsion, a ritual performed to try to relieve stress and worry caused by the obsession. So if I'm worried about germs, it's probably didn't even let me say what's the obsession. <laughs> let me try again. What would the obsession be? Washing, very good. Washing hands. So let's remember, we've got intrusive thoughts. Intrusive or illogical thoughts. Persistent intrusive thoughts about germs. And the only way for us to get rid of the feelings that come with those intrusive thoughts, remember, if we go back to the Those intrusive thoughts send us right through to our heart rate, our perception, our alertness, our everything is up and heightened. And the only way that we can deal with it is to wash our hands. Now, if we're having intrusive thoughts, and every time we're having those intrusive thoughts, how often are we probably washing our hands? A lot. All the time. Constantly. Do you think it would interfere with Coming, let's, coming here today, would it interfere with your ability to come here today if you were constantly having intrusive thoughts about germs to the point where you couldn't touch this table without washing your hands? Could you go to the grocery store? Could you get on the bus? No, you couldn't. And now your activities of daily living are totally impacted and we've pulled way away from our center balance. I've seen individuals who suffer from this very obsession with germs and deal with it by washing their hands and I've seen their hands that are cracked and bloodied because they can't stop washing their hands. It's the only way they know how to deal with those obsessive thoughts. Another example I'll use, there's an individual and his obsession was his family's safety. Very worried that something bad was going to happen to his family. So every night he'd wait for all his family to come home, come into the house when they were in bed, the doors were shut, he could start in the basement, and he'd check every outlet, every window, every door, and make sure everything was safe. And work his way from the basement all the way to the very top floor. Once everything was secure, he could go to bed. If someone got up in the night, if someone moved, if someone disrupted his check while he was going through, he got halfway up and his sister decided to go get a glass of water from the kitchen, got to start all over. Would that Im impact your ability to get a good night's sleep? Yeah. And how. And how. <coughs> So that's what we're talking about when we refer to obsessive compulsive disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder. The aftermath of a traumatic event. Threat of death to oneself or to someone else or to one's own or someone else's physical, sexual, psychological integrity. Increased arousal, avoidance of stimuli associated with the event and anxiety caused by recalling the event, including nightmares, flashbacks, and thoughts that are hard to get rid of. Pretty straightforward, I think. Schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a treatable biological brain disease that affects perception, thought, mood, and behavior. Perception, too. Think about perception. Schizophrenia affects about one in 100, and both men and women equally. 
but differently. I'm going to talk about the really common, just common symptoms, very simple stuff. We've got two types of symptoms, really, when we talk about schizophrenia. We've got our positive symptoms and our negative symptoms. And when I say positive, I don't mean you will be taller or a better athlete. They're, good. <laughs> they're not good. They're not good. Yeah. They're, not, they're not positive. These are things that are added to an individual, things that are added onto an individual's normal functioning. Negative refers to things that are taken away from an individual. That's the easiest way to think of it. Positive symptoms could include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized behavior, disturbances in thinking, and may have disturbances in feeling or affect, ambivalence or sensitivity. Who in this room can tell me the difference between a delusion and a hallucination? Hallucination is there in front of you, a delusion is in the back of your mind. It's a really good way to put it. The idea with a hallucination is it's a misconception of the senses. We can see something that's not there, hear something that's not there, touch something that's not there, taste something that's not there, smell something. Our senses are being misconceived. A delusion is a fixed thought or belief not based in reality, not logical. A, a common delusion could be something like the belief that the government is following me or poisoning my food. Have that fixed belief not based in reality. Negative symptoms, physical symptoms, Reduced motivation, social withdrawal, and I just, I really will quickly highlight, if someone is suffering from delusions or hallucinations, something like social withdrawal could be commonplace. If we have a, a fixed delusion in our mind that people are trying to poison our food, I'm probably not going to eat in the cafeteria. Change in habits or ability to function. So treatment options and some support services. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the options and some of the services that are here in Kortha Lakes. <coughs> Medication as an option. Counseling and therapy. Family and peer support. Now, the one I really do want to highlight is family and peer support. So we have what we call our formalized supports. Our psychiatrists, our, our doctors, our, our social workers, those are the, the formal supports. As a former frontline staff, I always, always, always highlight, and I try now as an educator to really emphasize the importance of what we call informal supports. That's family members, that's friends, that's peers, people that are there to support an individual as they're ill. They are such an important part to an individual's recovery. I supported individuals for five years. And I could be the case manager, and I could be there with good advice, so I could be there to help assist and advocate. But if someone's ill, someone's having difficulty on who they should trust, they're going to have a lot harder time trusting me, the social worker, than they are their wife, their friend, their sister, their brother, their husband. Those informal supports are so, so important to recovery. Early intervention is another key piece to recovery, and I'll talk a little bit about that as I hop along. Employment and academic support. And lifestyle changes, trying to avoid stress. Healthy eating is a key, key point to keeping ourselves mentally well. Regular exercise. Having hobbies or interests. And a sense of purpose. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight sense of purpose too. The idea that giving someone that sense of purpose that they have to get up and, and accomplish something for a day is a really, really important part to recovery too. And it can be as simple as every morning I get up and I meet, I'll use Joe again, I meet Joe for coffee every morning at 8 o'clock. I got to get up, have a shower, get my stuff together and get down to the coffee shop for 8 because he's waiting for me. That sense of purpose is enough encouragement for people to do well. It's a very important part of recovery. I'll talk a little bit about the support services that are available in Kortha Lakes. The first I'll talk about is what we call the LINX team. LINX team is the Early Psychosis Intervention Program, EPI. 
early psychosis intervention. Referring to psychosis, I'm talking about things like delusions or hallucinations. For people aged 14 to 35, in the early stage or their initial psychosis, we talk about early psychosis intervention. We know that with early intervention, four or five individuals will experience a full recovery. That's a pretty good batting average. The EPI program makes it their number one priority to connect with an individual, a young adult who's experiencing that first onset of psychosis, those symptoms that are present for the first time, and getting them to a psychiatrist as immediately as possible. Desi, who's going to talk next week, is in the EPI program. It's fantastic work. The idea is anybody can call the EPI program. Let's say we have a neighbor, a neighbor that's a good friend of ours, demonstrating some behaviors that we're recognizing as odd or strange or out of place. This young man is, is acting a little bit different than he normally has for the past years. He's, he's 18 years old now, and we're noticing him saying things and doing things that aren't usual for him. And we think something may be going on. You could call the Lynx team, a member of the EPI team, right here in Quartz Lake, someone just like Desi. And Desi himself will go out and meet with that individual within 72 hours. He'll sit with that young man and do what we like to call a little quick screen and determine whether or not this is actually psychosis we're seeing here. If it's determined that this, is, this could be psychosis, they'll be in front of a psychiatrist hopefully within one week. That idea of early intervention is a key, key part to what recovery. If, what if the person doesn't want to go to the psychiatrist? <laughs> when we're talking about any, well, I say, when I say we're talking about mental health supports, when we're talking about any supports, they're voluntary. Okay, but right? you see, the best thing you put on there tonight is the help button that the little girl pushed in the elevator. Mm -hmm. And can you do anything really for these people with this kind of problems yep. until they want to push that button? The only, there's only two, well, three criteria that can have someone go to a hospital and talk to a psychiatrist against their will. They've openly threatened to harm themselves, they're openly threatening to harm someone else, or they no longer have the ability to properly care for themselves, eat, and maintain. Very difficult to prove. One of the things I like to, I like to tell people, because I, I understand the frustration, because again, I was there, I was front line. I, I worked with individuals who maybe could have benefited from the help and, just, and were at a point where they did not want it. One of the things I always like to say when you can approach an individual like that is, is your life where you want it to be right now? Or is there ways that we could possibly improve? Are you happy with things? Because I have a way that might be able to make things better. You're, you're, you're telling me you're feeling sad or depressed. You're telling me you're feeling anxious or upset. You're demonstrating that you're feeling this way. Would you be willing to come with me and talk to Desi at the EPI team? Would you be willing to come to talk to me, come talk with me to someone at the Ross Memorial Hospital or the Canadian Mental Health Association? And if they say no, like I said, unfortunately, a lot of these services are voluntary. But if that's why, I remember, I highlighted that, that informal support to those family or friends, because they're the ones that are going to be there to keep trying, to keep saying, let's go today. They'll be there uh, on Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when things are at a low, and the person finally decides, all right, I'll go. Well, you know what? Let's hop in the car. Let's go. That's why I can't emphasize enough how important informal supports are. I think they're just absolutely integral. I know it's not the great answer you wanted. I, you, I, I think you're waiting for me. You wishing I had a red button to, to pull out? I'm going over to say to my client, you're correct. It's unfortunate. If I had a little red button, I'd probably be booked up a bit more. But, it, but again, it's that key, key point is that family and friends and peers and all the informal supports are a huge part to recovery. Another key thing we have in the community, and this is, this is those things, if you're thinking to yourself, but what can I do? Who can I call? This is another great resource to have. Four Counties Crisis. The first thing I'll highlight about Four County Crisis is they have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, holidays included, crisis line. 3 a.m. on Christmas Eve, 
There's a trained professional on the other end of that line who can take the call. Someone's feeling upset, frustrated, sad, overwhelmed. They can call this number and there's someone there to take the call. As well, it comes with a safe beds program. It's a home we have located in Peterborough where people can come stay for up to 10 days to kind of seek respite. Sometimes life at home can become overwhelming or stressful or people just need a chance to reset. Safe beds is a place where they can come. And even though you live here in Cortha Lakes, this four county crisis safe beds program is absolutely accessible for anybody in the city of Cortha Lakes. We also have what we call short term case management. Let's say someone calls four county crisis, that crisis line and they're presenting with a lot of different goals and things they really need help on and things they're having difficulty accomplishing on their own. They can be referred to our short-term case management program and meet with a case manager who can come out to their home, wherever they are in the city of Kawartha Lakes. Meet them at a coffee shop, meet them at the park, and sit down and start to work on goals and help them for up to 12 weeks. And in those 12 weeks, maybe get them connected with an even more appropriate service. The hospital to home program is also a four county crisis program the idea with the hospital to home program is when people are admitted to the hospital in the inpatient unit at Ross Memorial Hospital and then released, we know statistically when an individual is released from an inpatient unit, those seven days following they're at highest risk for harm to themselves. The hospital to home program recognized that and instituted a worker that actually sits in the hospital and assists people in that transition back to the community that can work with them it help make sure that transition is smooth and more comfortable. And I would be a terrible health promoter and educator. <laughs> and it would probably be reprimanded if I didn't highlight the programs that we can offer at the CMHA, because we have fantastic programs. And again, I have a whole little, we call it a one pager. It's like a cheat sheet of all the programs and services we offer. Some of the ones I'll highlight really briefly today, we have things like mental health case management, Someone who comes in off the street could access our intake or brief services, could walk in and say, I'd really like to sit down and talk with somebody. I've got these things going on, I'm suffering from depression, and I need some help. They don't need to be referred by a doctor or a physician, they can just walk right in. Justice services, we have spe specialized justice services. We have workers that go into our courthouse here in Lindsay. We also have release from custody workers, formerly me, who go into our super jail. We have housing support workers. We have homeless outreach workers. We have a whole list of workers that'll help you with essentially any need if you're ready to set goals and move forward with them. We also have our telemedicine OTN. Now I will say in Kawartha Lakes, we're still in the installation phase, but I can speak to you as someone who's seen it live in action in our corporate and client services offices in Peterborough. Our OTN machine is a fantastic piece of technology and you don't have to be a CMHA client to access it. Are people familiar with, the, with Ontario Telemedicine? I'm going to blow some of your minds because it was pretty cool and I got to see it in action. So let's say I need to see a specialist, a foot specialist. I'm up here rambling away and I kicked this table so hard I messed my toes up real bad. And now I've got to go see a podiatrist instead of foot specialist. Not bad. But this specialist I'm referred to is in Sudbury. And my appointment is for Tuesday at 11. Well, I've got to go to work. And maybe I don't drive. I don't have a vehicle. How the heck am I supposed to get to Sudbury to see the specialist? With Ontario Telemedicine, you could come into our office once it's up and running here in Kawartha Lakes, you'd sit in front of a big HD TV screen and mounted on top of that HD TV screen is a really high definition camera. And on the other end of the screen is a doctor who's got the exact same piece of equipment and you can see him clear as day. And the doctor has controls in his hand that can control that camera and move it around and zoom in and zoom out. And there will also be a nurse on hand right beside you. So the nurse can handle any of the doctor's questions, take your temperature, check your heartbeat, Take a look at that, that foot that you've maybe mangled up pretty bad kicking this table. All without having to leave Lindsay. 
and you don't have to be a CMHA client to access it. You just have to make sure that your specialist and your doctor are connected with the OTN network. And I can tell you more and more and more specialists are getting connected with this service. This is going to be the future of medicine right here is our OTN. I've put up here our contact numbers for Kortha Lakes and for Peterborough, our client service offices, as well as our website. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys having me.